All right, well, hello everybody and happy Earth Day. So thanks for joining us for this special panel webinar, Keeping Our Water Healthy Native Plants and Watershed. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. So thank you for joining us here on this beautiful Earth Day. Uh, and I also want to thank and recognize our Grow Native sponsors listed here on the screen. A uh, quick housekeeping for the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. Uh, this is a panel discussion. And while there are some prepared questions for the panelists, um, we'll also be taking some of your questions. So throughout the presentation here at the beginning, um, whatever's on your mind, go ahead and put that in the Q&A section, please. Um, I'll let you know this webinar is being recorded. Uh, the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with any resources talked about in today's presentation. So I'm gonna turn this over to our moderator, Stream Team United's Executive Director, Mary Culler. Thank you, Brooke. It's great to be here today on this beautiful Earth Day. And I th just wanna thank the Missouri Prairie Foundation and Grow Native Program for inviting Stream Teams United to participate in this panel today. As Brooke said, my name is Mary Culler. I serve as the Director of Stream Teams United. We are the Missouri Stream Team Watershed Coalition, and we are a coalition of 22 Stream Team Associations located throughout the state of Missouri. And we are a member of the Grow Native program because we realize how important native plants are for watersheds when it comes to water quality and also hydrology. And so I'm going to introduce our panelists that we have here today. Uh, first, we have Dale Blevins and Dale is a retired hydrologist from the USGS. He worked for 31 years for the USGS and he is a past president of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and also has served on their board of directors for 10 years. So welcome, Dale. We also have Rhonda Burnett. Rhonda is a community conservation planner with the Missouri Department of Conservation since 2005, and she is chair of the Grow Native Committee. Also on our panel today is Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore. Dr. Schulte Moore is a professor in the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management and Associate, Associate Director of the Bioeconomy Institute at Iowa State University. So welcome today to all of our panelists. And to start this off, I am going to show a short video that Stream Teams United was able to produce along with a, a partner, Health Literacy Media, that's an organization out of St. Louis. And we produced this video last year uh, through a grant from the Missouri Foundation for Health. So I will go ahead and start my screen or share my screen. And this video is entitled, Keeping Our Waters Healthy, It Starts With You. And that's something every time I see someone, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you um, own a quarter of an acre or a thousand acres, there's a role for everyone uh, when it comes to keeping our waters healthy. It starts with you. Clean water is great for so many things. It's healthy and refreshing to drink. You use it to wash your hands, cook your food, and bathe your cat, if you can. And how great is it to run through a sprinkler or jump in a pool on a hot summer day? But have you ever wondered where your water actually comes from? In northern Missouri, most of our drinking water comes from rivers and lakes such as the North Fork of the Salt River, which flows into Mark Twain Lake. Many of the small creeks and streams where we live flow into larger bodies of water that are our drinking water sources. So, if you dropped a stick into the little creek that runs through your field or neighborhood, it might end up in a lake used for drinking water. It's all connected. That's why what goes into our water matters to all of us. You may have noticed that water always flows downhill, often towards the nearest stream. Each stream has its own watershed. A watershed is the area of land that drains to a body of water. Creeks, rivers, ponds, and lakes all have watersheds. What happens in a watershed affects the quality of water downstream. When it rains, the rainwater runs over the ground and picks up loose particles on the ground, like soil, trash, and substances like oil or fertilizer. This is called non-point source pollution, and it hurts the plants and animals that depend on clean streams to live. It also makes it harder for people to clean and treat the water that becomes our drinking water. So, how can you help keep our water clean? First, 
let's start in our homes. Everything we flush or wash down the drain goes somewhere and can affect people and animals downstream. If your home is hooked up to a lagoon or the town's treatment system, your wastewater is treated to make the water cleaner before it flows back into the creek or river. However, some pollutants are hard to remove once they're in the water and can even end up in our bodies. So it's best to keep our water as clean as possible. That's why you should always think about what goes down your drain. Never flush or wash chemicals or medicines down the drain. Instead, check with your town or county to see where they can be disposed of safely. If it's harmful to you, it can be harmful to our water. Only flush toilet paper down the toilet. Even toilet wipes that say flushable can clog the plumbing and sewer system. Flushing items that contain plastic, such as dental floss or cotton swabs, can cause small plastic particles to get into our rivers and lakes and cause problems for both fish and people. Now you know how to be a water champion inside your home, but there are also plenty of things you can do outside of your home to help keep our water clean. Plant trees in your yard. The roots soak up rainwater and hold the soil in place to stop erosion. Erosion is when soil gets washed away, when it rains. Erosion is a type of non-point source pollution. And trees are great to climb on too. Start a gardening project choosing plants that are native to Missouri. Native plants are adapted to our soil and weather and need less fertilizer and watering, so they save time and money. Plus, they provide great habitat for pollinators, like butterflies. Let the grass in your lawn stand a little bit taller when you cut it. About three inches tall is perfect for most grass types. Taller grass helps rainwater soak into the ground rather than run off. If it soaks in, the soil stays in place and the water nourishes the grass. If you help wash your family's cars at home, let the soapy water run into the grass rather than into the street or storm sewer. The grass will filter out the soap so it doesn't end up in our water supply. And if you live on a farm, there are a few extra things you and your family can do to help keep our water clean. Instead of overturning the soil, try using no-till or lower tillage methods to prepare your fields for planting. This helps lower erosion and keeps the soil on your fields healthy. Leave a buffer of native plants between your fields and any nearby streams. The plants will help soak up flood water and filter out fertilizer and pesticides so they don't get washed into our creeks and rivers. Keep animal waste, for example from cattle or hogs, away from streams. This will help keep too much bacteria and nutrients from getting into the water. Too many nutrients can create algae blooms, which are harmful for drinking water and animals. And of course, whether you live on a farm or in a neighborhood, don't be a litter bug. Always throw trash into a trash can so it doesn't end up in our streams. Better yet, recycle when possible. Now you know how to be a water champion in and around your home. If you want to do more, join or start a local stream team. You can organize a river cleanup with your friends, plant trees and native plants, or pick up trash in your community. You can even adopt a stream to help monitor water quality. Learn more at streamteamsunited.org. Okay, well, thank you. And so we do have that video available on our Stream Teams United uh, YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and search Stream Teams United, you should find that video. It's also on our education page of our website at Stream Teams united.org. So feel free to share that uh, on social media or with any of your uh, friends and family or groups that you work with. So I'm going to start the session today by, oh, I need to turn off my, hold on a second. Sorry, I still have YouTube going in the background there. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a question of one of our, of our panelists now. 
This question will go to Dale Blevins. And Dale, as a hydrologist, can you just kind of tell us, describe how do native plants work for water and describe some of the things you've seen with some of your work? Dale, I think you're muted. You're going to need to unmute yourself. Dale, I think you're still muted. Okay, how about now? Okay. Okay, well, uh, the general accepted hypotheses are that prairie plants reduce runoff through increased infiltration and by slowing down the water flowing across the surface, it increases the permeability of the soil because it uh, the roots generally go much deeper than, uh, than a lot of other plants do and the native plants that is, the prairie plants. Uh, it's also been hypothesized that infiltration would show up in the streams later as base flow or as non runoff flow that occurs between storms. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to give you a whole lot more on this than what you really expected because we actually did a study on this uh, at the USGS, uh, just one of the last studies I did before we left. And it was comparing two prairie watersheds uh, of about four square miles, one in Missouri and one in uh, Kansas. One, the one in Kansas was in the Flint Hills uh, near Manhattan and the one in Missouri was at Prairie State Park. The one at Prairie State Park is probably the largest pure prairie watershed in the, left in the state of Missouri. It's only about 95% of it is still in prairie, only about 5% of it was in agricultural field. Um, and we also measured flow at, at six agricultural sites so we could compare the agricultural sites with the uh, prairie sites. So I'm just gonna, I got several of the findings from that study just to let you know what, what the effects on a watershed are of uh, the native um, prairie. Um, on a monthly basis, the total volume of storm runoff from a tall grass prairie was 35% less than runoff from agricultural watersheds. Uh, there's an ecologically sensitive flow characteristic called rise rate. It's how fast the water rises after a storm. And it kind of is a measure of how flashy the storm, how flashy the, the storm is and how quickly the water comes up and goes down. Uh, the rise rate was 30 times faster on the agricultural watershed than the prairie watershed. Uh, the maximum daily flows, in other words, the peak, the, the peak flow days, the days without the highest flows, were three and a half times less in prairie streams than agricultural streams. And I just point anecdotally, we noticed like one time there was like a four inch rain in our little stream on East Fork. Dryway Creek hardly sniffed at it, it hardly even hiccuped. I mean, if we got that up here in the city, it would be, you know, Brush Creek would they'd be calling sirens and there'd be people dying and it would be a major deal. And that, even ag watersheds, you know, your four inch rain would probably be causing flooding. We even had a seven inch rain that stayed in the banks of, of the creek. Um, the percentage of flow in the prairie streams that was runoff, in other words, that that came for directly from the storm was only about 35 percent. In agricultural streams, it was about 80 percent. Um, this was kind of one thing, though, that's a little surprising to us. Despite the increased infiltration in tall grass prairies, prairie streams experienced zero flows almost half the time compared to ag streams that were dry only 25 to 35 percent of the time. These zero flow periods, in other words, when the creek was not flowing, occurred almost exclusively in the summer and the fall. And that's primarily due, we think, because those prairie plants have some really deep fruits and can really suck the water out of the soil during the summer. And uh, it leaves a lot of room then in the soil to absorb uh, any, any rain that comes after that period. Um, so just to stump summarize, I guess I'd say the roots and the vegetative cover and water demand of tall grass prairie plants greatly reduces peak flows, peak flood flows. The rate of stream flow rises and the total volume of storm runoff. However, the evaporative demand of tall grass prairie reduces the amount of stream flow in the summer. 
If our tall grass water, watersheds were still covered with prairie, our streams would flood much less frequently and be a whole lot less flashy. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. That's very important information. You know, what we're seeing with climate change and our information from our state climatologists is we're getting more rain, um, more heavy rains. And so these native plants are one of these nature-based solutions that can help with uh, the more intense and more frequent flooding that we've been seeing here in the state and, and around our country. So thank you, Dale, for your research. Okay, I'm gonna pass the questions now over to Rhonda. And Rhonda works a lot with communities in an urban environment. So Rhonda, I'm just wondering if you can give us an example of a native plant project in an urban area that has been helpful for uh, their local water conditions. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, so the Missouri Department of Conservation, uh, which is the organization that I'm with, we conserve the fish, forest, and wildlife resources of the state. And I, I get to work with a lot of cities and give them some guidance on their stormwater management practices because when it rains in the city, that rain will eventually run off and enter into one of our creeks or um, sometimes at our groundwater system or other surface waters such as lakes. And all of those are going to be home of aquatic wildlife. So in conserving fish, forest and wildlife, um, we have a big concern about the quality of stormwater that is running off of our urban communities because water can carry with it all sorts of pollutants. Um, it can carry with it uh, heat in the form of thermal loading of the runoff and none of that is good for aquatic habitat. So thanks to the Clean Water Act at the federal level, um, each state has to comply with, with the um, requirements of that act. And here in Missouri, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources um, enforces those regulations. And there are many communities across the state that must maintain a stormwater permit with DNR. And so a lot of these communities will implement stormwater management practices. The photo that you see on your screen right now is at 18th and Broadway in Kansas City, Missouri. And this shows you an example of some of those practices that uh, larger communities are using to, to have native plants work with them as part of their their stormwater green infrastructure system. In this particular slide, we've got switchgrass growing right there between the sidewalk and the roadway. And the way that the road is graded and the openings along the curb are situated so that water flows from the street and it will travel downhill through that switchgrass bed. And then if you can see on that concrete sidewalk, there are grates that allow the, the water, once it travels through the bed full of grass, to then enter into the, into the block that also is just completely full of, of native plant landscaping. So this is an example um, in Kansas City. And I'll just quickly share another example of a different type of rainwater management practice. This is a rain garden that was constructed in the right of way in a neighbor, residential neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri. Um, on this particular block, there were several homeowners who agreed to partner with the city and they allowed the city to come in and do curb cuts that would allow water to flow off the city street, pool inside of a rain garden. And then once the capacity of that garden was, had been met, the water would flow back onto the street, downhill into a neighboring um, rain garden. And there was, there was about six of these rain gardens built all along the city street. And the combined result was that in future uh, rain events, at the end of that block where water historically had ponded and really posed a, a safety hazard at that intersection due to all the flooding, um, they greatly reduced that water that ponded there at that intersection, thanks to all these neighbors working together. The neighbors, maintain the gardens and the city of Springfield has just announced, I don't think there's even been a press release yet, but they've just announced that the city is going to start constructing free of charge rain gardens 
in right of ways and other public easements on homeowners properties. They will, they will construct the rain garden and plant them for free and the homeowners will then maintain them. And they think they'll have the capacity to do about six a year moving forward. So that's just a couple examples of how cities across Missouri are using native plants to help protect water quality. Great, thanks Rhonda. So Springfield is my hometown and so I'm very familiar with some of the local flooding issues they have. I don't know if it's because the city's very, very flat and not much of it <laughs> runs downhill. It's pretty flat. So that's really exciting to see some of the efforts. And again, another example of where native plants are helping not only water quality in a town, but also the volume of water. So thank you Rhonda with your, for your work. I'm gonna pass the questions now over to Dr. Schulte Moore. And Dr. Schulte Moore, can you uh, talk about the programs that you've been working on in the state of Iowa in the agricultural landscape? You bet, Mary. Um, and happy Earth Day, everybody. Thanks for logging on today. Uh, so I work on, on water quality and, and biodiversity in soil health and agricultural environments. So if we have any agricultural landowners here, um, I'm your gal. And even if you're not, we all need to eat, right? So we all have an investment in the agricultural systems. Um, I work on integrating in small patches and strips of native plants within the agricultural environment. And um, here you can see a, a stylized picture of, of one of uh, the kinds of conservation techniques we're using. It's called prairie strips. And just like it sounds, we're integrating in strips of prairie into crop fields. In this case, you see soybean on either side of the prairie, prairie strip here. And we've done research starting at uh, National Ri Wildlife Refuge in central Iowa that had some farmland uh, still on it and piloted the technique there. And what we found is that if you put about 10% of a crop field in prairie and are really smart about where you put it, you can improve that the impact of that crop field in so many ways in terms of environmental measures. So for example, you know, very much similar to Dale's work, we found that a 10% prairie strip in a crop field uh, we can reduce the amount of water leaving that watershed um, through surface runoff by 42%. And by uh, prairie strip and allowing it to infiltrate uh, through the soil profile and into groundwater, we've also shown that we can reduce the amount of phosphorus, a potent stream pollutant, uh, that makes it into the watershed by, by 80%. And we can reduce the amount of nitrogen um, leaving that field by 70%. The prairie roots, because they're so deep, they also treat groundwater um, on fields that are not tiled and can reduce the amount of nitrate uh, moving below that soil surface by 70% as well. In addition, prairie strips help keep soil the fields where farmers want it. Uh, we've shown that again a 10% prairie strip solution can keep 95% more of that uh, soil up in the field and keep it from moving off of off of that field and into our streams where of course that you know is again a, another pollutant that, that impacts stream biodiversity. We've seen that prairie strips also provides habitat. There was a, a, a Somebody put in the chat, what about the frogs and newts and such? We've shown that you know prairie strips can help improve uh, habitat for the critters on land, uh, increase bird biodiversity by about uh, by two times, and then pollinator abundance by three times compared to fields that don't have prairie prairie strips. We're, we've also been collecting data on the herpetofauna. Uh, don't have that those results quite ready to publish yet, but uh, we're excited by uh, the numbers and the numbers of breeding individuals of, of um, herps that we see associated with prairie strips that just aren't present on farm fields that don't have prairie strips. Have the website here uh, if you wanna know more information and looking forward to answering your questions if you have any, thanks. Great, thank you, Lisa. 
So I have a question. Um, I live in an agricultural area of Northeast Missouri and I actually live on a working farm and we do have um, some prairie buffer strips around different fields. And it, it is really amazing because the fields that are managed that way are so different. They are really like a wildlife oasis, I would say compared to a traditionally tilled field that does not have any uh, native grass habitat. But what have been the barriers that you've seen in the state of Iowa for getting people, landowners, producers interested uh, or willing to do this practice? Yeah, great question, Mary. Um, so the initial bar barrier was just knowledge, right? Uh, so prairie has not traditionally been a part of a conservation practice on farms, although that, that's changing. Um, and so the first barrier was just knowledge about what you know, prairie was and what prairie can, can do and offer to the crop environment. Uh, the second barrier is always cost. <laughs> um, and you know, I am talking about taking some land out of, you know, corn and soybean production and in this case. And, you know, that's how farmers, you know, that's how they make their living. And so anytime you talk about taking corn and soybean out, it's, you know, it, it can be tough. Um, but we have some farmers that were willing to work with us to pilot the technique. It, it fit their, their, they had places on their, on their farms where they, they weren't uh, seeing that the crops were yielding, yielding all that well anyway. They had concerns about soil loss. And of course, that's super important to the long-term sustainability of the farm. So they were willing to work with us to try to pilot this on, on the commercial farms. Uh, it's been very successful for them and they've been willing to talk to their neighbors and other people in their network about, about prairie strips. And those two things combined, the science that we did plus farmer willingness to try it and show that it worked on their farm has now made prairie strips eligible for conservation reserve program funding through the federal government. And so having that cost share available to help support the cost of transitioning some land out of row crop production and putting it into to prairie um, has really made a, a big difference. So about a year ago, we had we were working with you know uh, about 66 farmers, had about 500 acres of prairie strips here in Iowa. With that addition of the Conservation Reserve Program funding, now there's hundreds of farms that have prairie strips and about 3,500 acres of, of prairie strips just here in Iowa. It's a nationwide program, so there's actually prairie strips now established in 14 states across the country. And as uh, you know, we see the, the incentive payments increase for prairie strips, as, as uh, Secretary Vilsack announced what are the plans yesterday. We're hopeful that more farmers will see this as an option, again, to keep their soil, to keep nutrients on their farm and provide habitat. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna go to a, some of the questions we have in the Q&A. And there's some questions related to pesticides in these uh, prairie strip areas. So um, basically, you know, what about the crop pesticide treatments? Do they negatively affect these prairie plantings? Yeah, excellent questions. And uh, the, you know, the best places we've found with prairie strips are, are actually when the farmers have come forward and say that they want prairie strips on their farm uh, because then they're very motivated to when they're spraying their crops to be very careful about where the pesticides uh, end up. Uh, we have had situations where there's been herbicide drifts, for example, that have affected the edges of prairie strips. In those cases, we need to go back and reseed those areas again. Um, sometimes, depending on the time of year, the prairie still will come back from, from the roots and other areas and other times we've needed to, to reseed. In terms of the impacts on pollinators, we're in the process of doing those studies right now. We should have publications coming out on, on that in the next couple of years. And we've looked at uh, four different kinds of neonicotinoid pesticides, as well as a, a couple of fungicides. And we found that the seed treatments, at least in the, far, the farms that we've studied, um, have not had that great of an impact on the pollinator community. They do move in the environment. And we found that prairie strips are, are good at sort of uh, the, the soil community underneath prairie strips are good at treating those uh, chemicals and helping them to degrade. 
while they are getting into the plants, they're not at levels that would be lethal um, to the, the pollinators. And we looked at the plant uh, tissue itself, the herbaceous tissue, we've looked at the flower, flowers, the pollen, the nectar. And we've not seen that there has been, you know, that that's at a level such that it would cause a, a detrimental impact to the, to the pollinators. We are seeing that sort of the, you know, what farmers do when they get a, a, a foliar, when they foliar spray, say if they would have soybean aphids on their crops, sometimes those levels can be, be high enough to have definitely an impact on, on the insects should there be drift. And again, that's why it's so important that, uh, you know, that farmers follow the labels uh, in terms of spraying their crops and are really careful um, in terms of where it drifts. Great, thank you so much. And those those numbers, the data that you have, just amazing. You know, to reduce the volume of runoff, Dale's number is thirty five percent. Your number is forty two percent of the volume of of water. Uh, and then with nutrients reductions of 80% phosphorus and 70% nitrogen. That's just amazing. So obviously these native plants are just our natural tools for solving some of our problems and being able to have um, the crop systems that, you know, we, we have a way, we have a method to improve what's going on as far as what's reaching our waters. So thank you so much for your research. I'm gonna have my next question to Dale. And Dale also has a farm where he's implemented some of these uh, practices. And we have a question uh, in the Q&A related to eradicating fescue without using um, glyphosate. So any, any uh, tips on that, Dale? Or also if you could talk about, you know, maybe some, if you are a landowner, some species that you would kind of recommend in that uh, pasture or farm landscape. And also you could hit on some, what are some of the lessons you've learned as a landowner? Well, um, my recipe kind of has, I, I'm not going to consider myself an expert on this, but I have done quite a few restorations on, on our farm. Um, my recipe usually comes down to try to do it on a field that was in beans last year. <laughs> and uh, what I do is I just broadcast the seed uh, with a pendulum spreader, goes on a small tractor. Then I go over it with a cola packer, which is just kind of this, a lot of heavy wheels that have little ridges and kind of just move, packs the seed in the ground. And, uh, and that's, that's about it for the planting. And then, but the first year you need to be patient because uh, most times you don't think that anything's is going to show up, but you do. I, I do mow it a time or two that first year, so you can get light. It doesn't the, the the seeds don't get shaded out by the tall ragweed and mare's tail and all the stuff that comes up and shades everything out. And hopefully by the next year you'll you'll be seeing some some good stuff. Uh, the, the the species that that I have kind of settled on is to start off with is the grass species. I go with the short grass species. I go with uh, Cytos gamma and little blue stem. Prairie drop seed does not germinate very well in, in, in the field. I, I understand that even in greenhouses they have a hard time with it, but um, it, I mean, it's a good one too if you can get it. Uh, and then the bigger grasses sort of come in on their own <laughs> later. There's the Indian grass and the big blue stem and switch grass, they will, if, if they get, they'll take off first and shade everything out after you get too much of that. So I just generally let them kind of come in on their own over time and it, it, it's fine. Some of the forbs that I've had success with um, are prairie coreopsis and other coreopsis, partridge pea, bee balm, black-eyed susan, purple coneflower, rattlesnake master, beard tongue. Those are, those are species that a lot of the botanists don't get too excited about because they're common. But on the other hand, if you're trying to restore a, a prairie and, and that kind of thing, they're going to be there. They're going to be successful and they're going to be beautiful. So I, I start with the stuff that I think that are uh, easily easy to get started and will, will take off good. You can add the other more rare stuff over time. Uh, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. Now, oh, somebody asked about the fescue. Fescue is an order of magnitude harder to, to restore from because really you have to kill everything. In fact, uh, our prairie manager at NPF says the best thing to do is to put it into soybeans for two or three years and then plant it to prairie. 
um, because the, it's really hard to get the, the seeds, the seed bank that's in that soil killed um, before you get your prairie plants to take off. Uh, so it is hard. And I, I've always used Roundup to kill fescue and a couple rounds of um, spraying to kill it well before I tried to restore it. Great, and I'm wondering for our person that asked that question, if there would be a smart way to do that where they might be able to kind of um, stage their applications of Roundup so that they're not applying it all at once, that they were concerned about runoff to downstream properties and you know, always keeping that buffer between what you're doing on the landscape and our river will help uh, reduce inputs. I think. Thank you, Dale. Uh -huh. Rhonda, I'm going to ask you some of the same questions. You know, what things have you learned that um, would be considered lessons learned? And also, do you have any top picks for native plant species in an urban environment as it relates to water quality? Okay. Well, I'll do. Uh, I'll do some some of my favorite species uh, for the. Well, I'm going to I'm going to share a different screen. <laughs> I'll, I'll share some of my favorite species for urban projects first. Um, this slide I've got labeled as as a favorite rain garden plants. But really, there, there are multiple different types of stormwater management practices that these species will will succeed in. Um, these are some of my favorites for for urban community use just because um, they tend to be smaller in stature, have extremely showy, beautiful uh, flowers, and uh, more, more of um, an upright or vase form, as in the, the soft rush that's pictured there on the upper left. Um, Sedges that I like a lot, these are, these are ones that have a very compact form. They only grow to be about um, 18 inches tall. So they're beautiful for border, uh, border species of any of your practices. But those include tussock sedge and palm sedge. Some of the flowers or the forbs that I like most, um, golden ragwort, it, it will create a beautiful, almost evergreen ground cover for you. And then in early spring have beautiful little yellow flowers. Mist flower is pictured there on um, the upper right. Copper iris is that middle flower, uh, middle picture on the left side. Orange cone flower and Ohio spiderwort, also um, foxglove beard tongue are some of the other flowers that I like. And then the photo there on the middle right shows shining blue star. This is a photo that I took along the James River in, um, I believe it was Christian County in Southern Missouri. And you can see that the form there is just, it's very attractive. Shining blue star makes a really nice hedge if you plant it in a row. I've done that for several um, projects where I wanted to create a, a hedge as a barrier between a parking lot and an infiltration basin. Then on the bottom left is a picture of a button bush a bloom. And it's, um, it's great in rain gardens, especially because uh, shrubs and trees, I love them in infiltration practices because they do take up a lot of room. They infiltrate a lot of water or they um, will uptake a lot of water, especially certain tree species like willow trees. So if you have a lot of volume you're trying to um, manage, trees and shrubs are great for that. Also, um, it can be a way to, to, to really um, stretch your dollar for your project. If you only need to buy two or three shrubs as opposed to a hundred forbs and grasses and, and sedges and rushes, um, you can really make your dollar stretch and fill up the same area. Uh, with uh, a lot fewer plants. And then trees, the, the photo there on the lower right is an Ohio buckeye. Um, I took that photo but very close to a creek side. So that's one of my favorite tips for learning about native plant species is get out and, and walk along those 
creeks and rivers and in the marshy areas and take photos of all the plants that you see growing that you like best and then identify them later. And um, oftentimes you'll be able to find them at one of our native plant nurseries to purchase. But red buckeye has a beautiful red bloom to it and then bald cypress trees, of course. Um, even though we think of them as a swamp tree, they, they do really well in, in urban situations. I've seen them even in parking lots where, where they um, are very successful and of course have such a beautiful sort of uh, pyramidal form to them. They are deciduous though. So if you don't know that, you might think that your, your evergreen tree is, uh, is dying in the winter time, but it's okay. Bald cypress are deciduous and they will leaf back out. So that's a quick rundown. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cede the floor if somebody else would like to answer a question now, because I've got, I've got all sorts of lessons learned I can share. <laughs> Thanks, Rana. We did have a question in the uh, question and answer. The, they were asking about the purple blooming plant. I think it was in the upper right-hand corner again. They were asking about what, what plant that was again. Yeah, that was mist flower. Um, mist flower used to be in the Eupatorium genus, but um, I think it's botanists that are in, in charge of renaming plants on us because it, it, uh, it never fails. My favorite ones that I memorize the scientific names of, a few years later, the names change on me. Um, but yes, that's, that's the mist flower. It only gets to be about uh, 12 to 18 inches tall, and it is now uh, conoclinium colestium. Great, thank you. I'm reading a comment in the question and answer. Doug Helmers from Iowa he said he had the opportunity to work with Dr. Schulte Moore on and off for 10 years and getting the prairie ships program into CRP is a really big deal. So um, I don't know all the history on that, but it sounds like you guys worked very hard on that. So thank you again for that work. And, and a related question is to uh, Lisa. Ha, is there information about the potential carbon sequestration of these prairie strips? And have you heard anything recently or is there anything kind of in the works related to potential carbon credits? Great questions. Uh, the lots of interest in carbon these days. Um, so we're actively studying that question. My colleague Marshall McDaniel, who's a soil scientist here at Iowa State University, um, and what he's done, some of the work that he and his students and postdocs have done, they've looked at uh, grassland reconstructions across the whole Midwestern region. And they found that across the region, CRP grasslands, that uh, um, on average, they're accruing about 1% uh, of soil carbon per year. And um, well, and that, that work is, it has been published. I can put the link to that paper in the chat. What we haven't published yet is how that compares to our prairie strips reconstructions, um, but we found that very consistent, uh, consistently we found that the, to be the case as well, about 1% increase in soil organic matter per year. Um, and so the longer it's in there, the more you know, carbon you, you can accrue. Um, and of course, for the developing carbon markets, there's a lot of uh, interest in sort of additional carbon, right? As well as the permanence of that carbon. Um, you know, it'll make, we have to see how willing uh, farmers are to sort of uh, commit to sort of permanence of, of pr practices like prairie strips, um, because to enter a carbon market on with prairie strips, they would have to commit, you know, to keeping that in place. Uh, one of the reasons why some of the farmers that we work with are interested in prairie strips is they're looking at it as a way to regenerate soil health in areas where it has uh, been degraded through farming practices over time. Um, so they're thinking about, you know, say a 10 or 15 year contract uh, uh, of prairie strips, uh, say through the CRP program, improving the soil health on those acres over time, and then eventually, you know, putting that back into production because they know that the, the soil health will be, will be improved um, by those native plants. 
And then hopefully they would reestablish, uh, you know, those prairie strips on another area of their field to, you know, continue that cycle of, of soil regeneration using native plants for soil regeneration. Now, if they till that prairie strip in order to do so, about half of that carbon is going to burn up in just that first year and then slow declines over time. You know, this is what we think, I would say at this point, you know, we haven't actually tested this yet, but this is what we think based on other scientific literature. You know, if they, they would continue to till that over time, we would expect, you know, continued losses of soil carbon. And that just happens because when you till the soil, um, you get more oxygen in the soil and those microbes that are, are there already in the soil, just they get a boost, right? And they, they start chomping away at the carbon and, and releasing it as, as carbon dioxide. So we do know prairie strips can help, um, you know, with in terms of accruing soil carbon, whether you know farmers would be interested in entering a carbon market to do that it probably depends on the price of carbon right and what they would get per ton of carbon um, and then they you know would have to think about how that would work within their overall operation and helps them achieve some of their goals but great questions great thank you and have another question for you. So related to like placement of the prairie strips within the field, we had a question of whether or not they work in the bottomlands, but you know, are most of the strips that you're putting in through this program on the edge of the field or are they more in the middle of the field like your diagram showed or are there multiple strips in a field? And so I guess kind of what's, if you could speak about the placement and, and, and also, as far as how it works with farmers and moving their equipment, because I know living on a farm, that's always a concern. Well, I can't drive through that. I have to move, you know. So if you could speak on that for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like no two strips installations are the same, right? It always has to fit into that field and that in that farming operation, right? And that the template that the landscape, right, and that of that field. Um, you know, what is nature given the farmer to, to start with? Um, so no two installations are the same. It's got to be a, you know, a, a back and forth process in terms of the design, in terms of what works for the farmer. Um, you know, also if they do want to, you know, get the federal CRP cost share payment for it, it's also got to, you know, fit in with uh, those stipulations. One of the great things about getting uh, prairie strips in uh, as a CRP eligible practice is CP43, if you'd go into your USDA service center and ask for it, is that it is one of the most flexible CRP practices out there. And what we're hearing for, from, from farmers is they're choosing it because it is so much more flexible than many of the other practices available to farmers. Uh, we worked really hard with USDA to make sure that language was, was flexible. And so um, it can be applied to say a field border situation. We have a lot of farmers on that farm hillier grounds that put it on the, on the edge of fields, um, the, the headlands where they drive their tractors you know, up and down the field. So pr protecting those headland areas. It can be wo woven across hill slopes like in the picture that I shared with you. So as a true strip on the contour line of, of a field of a slope, it can be put at sort of the bottom of a slope and sort of those low lying areas, more of a patch in the low lying areas. So yeah, it's the, the practice is, is very flexible. And, um, and uh, you know, on the website, we've kind of put in the key criteria in terms of, of integrating in that, that uh, practice into farm fields. Uh, you can ask for the local C uh, USDA service center, CP43, but it is sort of a, there is a design process, right? Um, that's a back and forth in terms of getting something that, you know, helps protect that field and treat the water that's running off of it, but also still works for the farmer and their operation. Great. Thank you, Lisa. So CP43, if you're a landowner, farmer, producer, go into your USDA office and ask about CP43. If you're not a landowner, spread the words with your friends, CP43. And check out uh, the Iowa State's, uh, I, I guess, Lisa, what would be the best way to connect with learning more about your program? 
Yeah, we try to keep our website as up to date as possible. So www.prairiestrips.org. Um, that's the shorthand that will get you there. And uh, we're continuing to update the information that's there. If you, if you have a question that we don't answer, you know, reach out. Um, there's a whole list of, it's a big team. We have a communications person that is sort of the front person uh, that answers, uh, starts out answering the question. If there's a deeper, you know, design question, we have a farmer liaison on our team that, that helps answer questions. Or if it's a science question, Omar can put you in touch with one of the scientists on the team to get that answered. Awesome, great, thanks. I think I have time to pass one more question off to one more panelist. And Rhonda, I'm gonna ask you to speak about some of your lessons learned in your work. We, and we also have a question that you might be able to answer at the same, same time as far as uh, what recommendations do you have for designs and materials to construct environmentally friendly driveways? So has any of your work focused on driveways? And it kind of gets back to uh, one of the other questions uh, as far as in an urban uh, community, what would be a good first step? If this is like totally brand new to someone, where should they go to try to do more? Okay, well, um, grownative.org uh, is a wonderful resource. There are so many templates of gardens and top 10 lists and all sorts, I mean, there are, there are there are more educational resources on grownative.org than you can shake a native stick at. Um, so I would start there first. And I have a, um, a recommendation about the driveways. There is up in Chicago, they did a green alley guidebook so they could convert alleyways um, in urban Chicago into a green alley. So if you just Google Chicago green alleys, you should be able to download a, a free PDF and learn about uh, what they looked at as far as pavement materials and plants. Um, and I think any of those concepts could be converted over to a driveway from an alley uh, situation. Um, here's a slide I prepared for everyone on a, on a lesson learned though, and this has to do with communication. I did not realize that um, not everybody thinks about the idea of time the same because I am a very linear thinker. So I just assumed everybody thinks about time exactly the same way as I do. But I heard a question one time and it was, how do you think about time? Does it stretch in front of you as a never ending line? Which yes, it does for me. Or is it circular like the face of a clock? Does each day start at midnight and go into a complete circle of time for you? Does each week start on Sunday and go into a circle into Saturday night? Does each year start in January and go into a circle into December and so on? And that was one of those mind blowing moments because when I talk to people about planting native plants and considering the height of the plant and the bloom time or other design characteristics throughout the year, and is there a season or a month of the year that you are building this, this uh, native garden around that you want it to look outstanding for a certain event I always talked, I always made these great little graphs like the one on, on the left of your screen. I just do these in Excel. And I thought that communicated um, my concept and my recommendations um, very, very well that, that real communication was happening. And then I heard this tricky little question about time. And I realized that, that if, if you're a circular thinker, my line graph is, is letting you down. So I worked with James River Basin Partnership and the city of Springfield, and we developed this circular calendar, a one-year calendar for when plants in our, in our rain garden brochure that we were developing, when these rain garden plants would bloom throughout the year. And I tell you what, Mary, when people pick up this brochure and they're circular thinkers, they look at it and immediately they go, ah, aha, okay, I see, I understand. And the linear thinkers, they pick it up and they rotate the page and they rotate the page. And finally they go, oh, okay, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. Um, so that's a lesson learned on communication and realizing that not everybody sees the world as you see it and there are different ways to explain concepts. Um, but everybody's on board with, with 
uh, the native plants is just figuring out how to explain them in a way that they understand. Okay, did that get all the questions? <laughs> I think so. Okay. Okay, well, um, we're nearing the end. I think the Missouri Prairie Foundation may jump in here for a second, but um, you know, I think we've seen both in the urban environment and in the agricultural environment and with uh, our hydrology and other research that these native plants provide a great solution to some of our environmental problems, a lot of our environmental problems. So for everyone listening today, um, well, first I just wanna thank the panelists for the work that they do and the research that they do. And for everyone listening, um, you know, one thing we can do in 2021 is just try to get more native plants out there into our communities, into our fields. This is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and I want to thank Mary and our wonderful panelists for an excellent presentation. Um, all of your points of view are extremely important. Um, and on this Earth Day, we are reminded, of course, that uh, water is something that connects all of us. And by choosing native plants that are native to where we live, we can protect that water. Uh, those water sources and enjoy the many other benefits that native plants provide. I want to thank Brooke also for all of her work in coordinating today's presentation and uh, Brooke will be sending a recording to everyone including uh, links to resources that were shared today in the chat and, and some other resources from our Grow Native web, uh, uh, website. Um, do check out the grownative.org uh, website as Rhonda mentioned um, also, the, the String Teams United uh, webpage as well. And we do have a number of native plant sales that we've organized uh, here in Missouri and uh, lots of other events uh, uh, for you to enjoy native plants first, firsthand. Um, thank you again, everyone, for uh, tuning in today. And great big thanks to Dale, Lisa, Rhonda, and Mary. Have a good uh, evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Carol. Happy yes. Happy Earth Day. Yes. Mm -hmm.